can we start now? Assalamualaikum. Salam Datuk. Okay, kita boleh ngomong sekejap Fatihah. Okay, uh, uh, boleh yang mula. Okay. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And not to forget to our supervisor, Dr. Alwi, for joining us today. Uh, to all, uh, welcome to our seminar this morning, which uh, regarding the endocrinology seminar 6. And for today, we will learn about uh, we will learn about four topics, uh, which regarding uh, childhood diabetes mellitus, and hypopituitarism, hyper and hypopituitarism, and also uh, recaps. And for the first one, uh, which will be presented by me, regarding childhood diabetes mellitus, my name is uh, Muhammad Ifa Azaim Benzo Azmani, material number 1812523. So in this topic, uh, we will go through uh, these outlines uh, first regarding the physiology, classification, uh, clinical manifestations, uh, pathophysiology, uh, and also its uh, complication. And the last one regarding the investigations. So the first one uh, regarding physiology. So when we talk about uh, diabetes mellitus, for sure we will are uh, talking about uh, the blood uh, glucose level and also its regulation in our body. So diabetes uh, is referring to the uh, chronic metabolic disease characterized by hyperglycemia as its uh, cardinal biochemical uh, feature. So as we all know, uh, diabetes is an abnormal condition and of course there must be uh, something uh, wrong with the blood glucose uh, hemostasis process. And it is important for us to know uh, first regarding the uh, normal physiology one. So, the first one uh, regarding the blood glucose uh, regulation uh, is mainly controlled by uh, the <coughs> for endocrine function of uh, pancreas, it is uh, controlled by several types of hormone. Uh, to be specific, insulin and glucagon. Where does this hormone came from? Is from the islet of uh, Langerhans, uh, which consists of uh, several types of uh, cells, such as alpha, beta, gamma, and also F cell. Uh, and then, uh, among these uh, four types of cells, uh, there are two uh, cells that are important, which is the alpha and also beta cells. So alpha cells uh, functions to secrete insulin. And also, uh, beta cells will produce. No, no, okay. Beta cells will produce insulin, and while alpha cells will produce glucagon. So, uh, what does this hormones do in uh, to our bl uh, blood glucose uh, level? Uh, to put it in a simple understanding uh, figure, so um, insulin uh, decreases the blood uh, glucose by stimulating the glucose uptake of the cells. Uh, from the blood so the glucose from the blood goes into the cell how uh, mainly due to the uh, binding of the insulin to the insulin receptor of the cell this will form the glucose transporter which later will uh, bind to the cell membrane and make it a channel for the glucose to uh, get into the cell uh, besides that it, uh, insulin also stimulates the uh, you know increase the uh, decrease the blood glucose concentration by gluco, uh, glycogenesis and also glycolysis. And meanwhile, for glucagon, uh, it functions to increase the blood glucose level by stimulating the gluconeogenesis and also glycogenolysis through formation, uh, through this formation of new blood glucose and also breakdown of the glycogen stored in the liver. Uh, this glucose will be released into the blood uh, so that is uh, will be increase the blood glucose concentration 
uh, as for uh, to form the fuel for our body to get the energy. So uh, this is the normal uh, physiology one. So what happened in uh, the uh, diabetes mellitus? In diabetes mellitus, the blood group blood regulation process is impaired, which will lead to the high level of glucose in the body. So how does it occur? First, we need to classify the diabetes mellitus um, into several categories or several classes, uh, which uh, differ from its uh, etiology um, from different types, so different etiology. So this is a picture I get from uh, Nelson, uh, which displays the etiology and classification of uh, diabetes mellitus. But I'm not going to get through the, all of it. So, uh, will you at the uh, right uh, right side? Uh, in ISPAD 2014 guidelines, there are four major categories uh, that need to be our main concern. The first one is diabetes uh, diabetes mellitus type one, diabetes mellitus type two, other specific types uh, secondary to diabetes syndrome uh, due to drugs, and the last one is the gestational uh, diabetes. So in this topic, what we are referring to is the, the, top, uh, the top two. So the first one, type 1 diabetes mellitus, it is um, a condition where the diabetes mellitus occur results from the deficiency of insulin secretion due to pancreatic beta cell damage. This damage um, cause, will cause a low or no insulin will be released into the blood. So as for type 2, is the consequences of insulin resistance, uh, meaning that the insulin cannot exhibit its uh, function towards the cell, as the cell cannot respond to the insulin properly. So uh, in Malaysia, uh, worldwide, uh, type 1 is the most common one uh, for child, children and also adolescents. However, uh, type 2 uh, diabetes mellitus is on a rising stand, uh, rising. Uh, trend uh, throughout the whole world, so it is uh, increased years by years. So, um, how can we differentiate between these two? Uh, we can refer to this table. The first one regarding the onset. Usually, type one uh, diabetes mellitus will occur or exhibits its clinical manifestation. Uh, basically, uh, in six months to young adult, meanwhile for type two, usually puberty or later. Its uh, clinical presentation was often uh, in, uh, acute for type 1, and while for type 2, often it is insidious. So uh, we need to detect uh, yearly so that we can manage the patient better. And also type 1, regarding the etiology, uh, the presence of autoimmunity is one of the uh, main cause. And while for type 2, there is no autoimmunity uh, towards the pancreas. And ketosis, uh, occur in type 1, while in type 2 is rare. Uh, for body habitus, uh, for type 1 patient, uh, usually is lean but can be overweight following uh, population frequency. Meanwhile, for type 2, uh, usually is associated with uh, overweight and obese uh, person. Uh, regarding the insulin uh, in type 1, because there is uh, pancreatic beta cell damage, so the insulin will be low or absent. Uh, we'll, we will get through this uh, uh, pathophysiology uh, later. And for type 2, it's uh, normal, uh, can be normal, decrease or increase. Depends on the progression of the uh, pathophysiology. And uh, acanthosis negricans uh, regarding the blackening and darkening, darkening and thickening of the skin, mainly at the armpits, uh, back of the neck, uh, usually uh, appear in obese, uh, overweight, or type 2 patient. So it is one of the common uh, presentation that uh, we can detect uh, based on the inspection uh, only. So uh, for clinical manifestation, it can be yearly uh, manifestation or late manifestation. However, for late, it uh, refers to the complication if uh, the patient is not treated or managed properly or yearly. So um, most of the time, um mainly uh, most of the time the symptoms uh, might overlap between these two types uh, type 1 and type 2 but uh, the common presentation that we can see in both type of diabetes mellitus is 
uh, can be tightness, weakness, uh, polyphagia, uh, always uh, feeling hungry, polydipsa, always, always feel thirsty, uh, polyura, frequent urination, and also weight loss. And for peripheral neuropathy and also retinopony, mainly is occur uh, late or can be seen or not, but in early, usually uh, polyphagia, polydipsia, polyura, and weight loss, uh, we can detect uh, early. In uh, uh, in pediatrics and child health uh, textbooks for from uh, UMPS, uh, one of the uh, mnemonic or acronym that we can use in order for us to remember the symptoms for uh, type one diabetes mellitus, we can use the forty, uh, which is the thirst, toilet, uh, thin, and tired for uh, polypsia, polyura, weight loss, and also uh, tightness. And this is uh, what uh, we can quite uh, easily remember throughout this picture. And then, so, how does this uh, type 1 and type 2 occur? Mainly, type 1, uh, DM, uh, diabetes mellitus, is due to the autoimmune destruction, which can be caused by two things, uh, genetic susceptibility and also environmental factors. For genetic susceptibility, uh, it can be due to actually mutations because uh, over 90% uh, cases for type 1 diabetes mellitus is associated with the presence of HLA DR3 and also HLA DR4. And for environmental triggers or factors, mainly it can be due to diet, uh, virus, uh, drugs, toxins, and also stress. Uh, these two. Uh, factors can disrupt the self tolerance of our immune uh, cells towards the pancreatic beta cells. So um, remember that the diabetes refer to the high blood glucose, right? So when there is damage of pancreatic beta cells, there will uh, there will be no uh, insulin, or absence of uh, beta cells can cause uh, insulin to be dropped, um, so to very low or absent. So uh, when there is the, uh, there is autoimmune attack uh, towards the beta cells, mainly by T cells, it also can produce the autoantibodies. This uh, T cell and also uh, autoantibodies will attack the beta cells and then will make the mass of the beta cells become lower and reduce. Uh, however, uh, the pancreas can can will still try to compensate the insulin deficiency situation. However, if the, the damage or destruction of the beta cells uh, become reduced, even uh, reduced uh, below 10%, uh, the clinical manifestation can occur. So, uh, what type of uh, type 1 DM? It is uh, regarding the uh, type 1. So, uh, this is basically the simple uh, figure that we can use to know the pathophysiology or regarding complication. One of the uh, main serious complication that we need to that need to be our main concern regarding type one diabetes mellitus is diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, diabetic uh, referring to hyperglycemia, keto uh, ketone bodies, acidosis regarding the acidosis uh, due to the uh, ketone bodies. So the first one, uh, remember that type one diabetes mellitus referring to the absolute insulin deficiency because no beta cells insulin. So uh, the body will try to compensate this insulin uh, deficiency through counter-regulatory hormone. First, uh, there will be increase in gluconeogenic uh, enzyme which can lead to high uh, gluconeogenesis process, high glycogenolysis process and also reduce glucose utilization because uh, we want to to get the insulin or we need uh, the cell is starving. So they want uh, glucose to be inside the cell. And this, uh, through formation of uh, new glucose from amino acid, from uh, lipid uh, or LD tissue, is related to hyperglycemia. Uh, there is hyperglycemia, more glucose. The body will try to get rid of the excess uh, glucose through glycosuria, um, the, one of the presentation. Lah. And then if there is uh, also any glucose, uh, this will lead to occurrence of osmotic diuresis. Osmotic diuresis, theoretic, uh, so many uh, frequent uh, 
uh, urination. So there will be less um, water in our body, and this will lead to severe dehydration, also electrolyte imbalance. Uh, and our body will try to compensate through the feeling of thirsty, uh, so that uh, in order for uh, our body to compensate the fluid loss. This is for uh, kind of diabetic one, hyperglycemia. But what about the ketoacidosis? Uh, when there is uh, low uh, glucose in cell, the body will try to uh, increase the glucose level through lipolysis, uh, and then uh, lipolysis will increase, which will lead to increase in uh, amount of free fatty acid, and free fatty acid also can uh, cause the formation of ketogenesis which will lead to high uh, amount of uh, ketone bodies. When there is excessive ketone bodies in our body, uh, this uh, will lead to ketonuria, uh, same like uh, glycosuria, uh, glucose will be eliminated. And while for ketone bodies, it also will be eliminated. But when there is uh, too many ketone bodies uh, level in our body, it will lead to acidosis because ketone bodies is acidic in nature. And this acidosis process is uh, associated with a uh, different complex uh, process, which will lead to several uh, late complications uh, or manifestation, such as abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, small respiration due to uh, respiration of the due to the metabolic acidosis situation, and also ketone breath. Uh, the patient, the breath of the patient will smell like acetone, and if the, this uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, uh, is too is too severe, or does not treat it uh, as fast as we can. This will lead to weakness, confusion, and also uh, even worse, uh, death. So this uh, the serious complication for type one diabetes mellitus. But what about the type two diabetes mellitus? Uh, it can be due to uh, it is multifactorial, but uh, it can be due to many factors, but uh, the series of main factors that can lead to this complication or pathophysiology is regarding the unhealthy lifestyle and also uh, genetic susceptibility, aging, and also medication. When there is overeating or obese and in sedentary lifestyle, the intraperitoneal cavity will accumulate and uh, accumulate the visceral fat which will lead to secretion of inflammatory mediators, adipokines, and also free fatty acid. Adipokines uh, can be many types. Uh, some can increase the insulin uh, sensitivity. Some can uh, reduce the insulin sensitivity. But in this case, uh, it will reduce the insulin sensitivity, uh, like uh, TNF-alpha. And then uh, also, these uh, factors can cause the insulin resistance. Uh, which, uh, when there is uh, insulin resistance, the beta cells will try to compensate uh, by produce more insulin. Uh, more insulin will be uh, secreted. However, over time, if there is still progression, uh, it is if it is becomes more severe, the beta cells will uh, like uh, tie it up, so uh, reduce the insulin secretion. And when there is reduced uh, insulin secretion. The beta cells uh, will deteriorate and cause the insulin deficiency to occur. So uh, at first, uh, insulin level is uh, normal. However, over time, if it's uh, severe enough, the insulin deficiency uh, will occur. So there is no insulin uh, plus with insulin resistance. This will lead to type 2 diabetes mellitus. And if it is still progress, there will be complication. However, uh, in type 1, uh, the serious complication is uh, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Meanwhile, for type 2, uh, is regarding the hypoosmolar hyperglycemic state, uh, HHS. So, hypoosmolar, uh, high level of solute in the, in the blood, hyperglycemic, hyperglycemia state. And then, uh, at first, uh, for type 1, there is uh, absolute insulin deficiency. Oh, how it works. Salah. So, uh, for type 2, it is not absolute but relative uh, insulin deficiency combined with counter regulatory hormone, same like uh, in type 1, there is glucogenesis, glycogenesis, glucosetalization, which will lead to uh, hyperglycemia, 
leukosuria, osmotic diuresis, polyuria, hydration and also intraolite uh, imbalance. However, uh, this uh, if it's severe, uh, become more severe and progress, it's related to uh, reduce uh, extracellular fluid volume. Uh, and meanwhile, for extracellular fluid osmolarity will be increased because more solute but less water. Uh, this will lead to uh, some condition like hyper, like hyper and hypernatremia, which can lead to uh, brain swelling, which can lead uh, to more serious complication like neural damage, uh, like, uh, like the symptoms like uh, delirium, lethargic confusion, and also coma. And also, if there is uh, less compensation from uh, the kidney. This will lead to renal failure. So type 1, PK, type 2, HSS. This uh, we need to manage uh, and treat daily. So we try to manage through the uh, its symptom like glycosuria, where we give, uh, no, um, polydipsia, we give fluid or electrolyte imbalance, we give uh, electrolyte and so on. So and so we need to treat the insulin uh, secretion and also insulin. Uh, sensitivity. We need to carry the abnormality. So, uh, in order for us to diagnose or <coughs> diagnose these two types of diabetes mellitus, we need to do several investigation, mainly be, uh, due to the glucose level, lah, and also uh, regarding the diagnostic criteria. For diagnostic criteria of uh, diabetes mellitus, in order for us to diagnose it as diabetes mellitus, we need to check the uh, patient uh, throughout. Uh, his or her clinical features, symptoms, and also biochemical criteria, uh, mainly the blood glucose level. If there is classic symptoms of diabetes or hyperglycemic crisis like uh, polyuria, uh, thirsty, uh, glycosuria, and so on, uh, we need to uh, check also the glucose level. So there are four parameters, uh, random glucose, uh, fasting glucose, uh, oral glucose tolerance test, and also HB1C. Uh, I call it uh, hemoglobin. So the, if it is, it is uh, higher than normal range, uh, we can diagnose it as diabetes mellitus. But uh, in order for uh, to differentiate between type 1 and type 2, there are two, uh, uh, two more investigations that we can do. Uh, first, autoantibodies testing because uh, that is in type 1, that is uh, autoimmunity, right? So there will be autoantibodies like, uh, there are many. Mm many uh, antibodies that we can detect that. So we just uh, do the blood test lah, and the uh, serology test. And then if uh, also we can do the fasting C-peptide. Fast, uh, C-peptide uh, refers to the, uh, in order for the, for the pancreas to produce insulin, there must be uh, its uh, precursor, right? So pro-insulin is the precursor of insulin. In order for pro insulin to produce insulin, it will be uh, it will be degenerate into insulin and also C peptide. So when there is C peptide, of course, uh, there is insulin. So if uh, in type one uh, diabetes mellitus, the, the C peptide is suppressed because uh, in type one reduce insulin, right? So reduce insulin, and in that reduce C peptide level, and then we can diagnose the Mm, diabetes mellitus uh, as a diagnostic uh, disease for uh, our patient. So <clears throat> I guess it's all. And this is my reference. Oh, uh, regarding the pathophysiology and also uh, complication, this is the simple figure or simple flow for uh, my presentation. However, if you want to get a more detail, you can uh, see the this picture like uh, for pathogenesis of diabetes mellitus type 1 uh, for DKA punya, uh, pathogenesis pathophysiology for diabetes type 2 uh, pathophysiology and also the pathophysiology of the uh, HHS hypoosmolar hyperglycemic state so uh, I guess that's all from me okay thank you mm, okay uh, welcome Oh, the end of the
Okay, uh, Kalbe try to keep it short lah. Try to keep it, uh, try to keep your presentation short. At most, 20, 20 minutes. 20, 25 minutes to at most lah. Uh, anyway, uh, so the is very important. Any questions? Any questions? So, ada soalan nak? Dengar tak? Dengar tak? Dengar tak? Okay. Uh, actually, some countries kan, especially the Scandinavians, okay, because type 1 DM is most common dekat Scandinavian countries lah. Norway, Sweden, semua tau. So, what they did is they did, uh, they did universal screening. So, they, they detect, they check for HLA, uh, HLA B23, yes. Uh, kan, HLA B23 kan? Macam nama macam HLA B23? Uh. Uh, yeah, they check for that uh, to all infant newborn. So to all newborn, ah, uh, and they they will start ah, uh, and they will monitor the ah uh, pancreas, ah, uh, by monitoring the level of insulin and also the size of pancreas lah, uh, ah, through MRI semua benda semua, and ah, uh, sometimes they can start, they ah, uh, start some of the center they start steroid lah, they start steroid earlier to prevent ah uh, inflammation, because you know the type one DM is. It's a autoimmune condition, mm. so the autoimmunity actually destroyed the pancreas. Uh, so far. And then, uh, secondly, I noticed, and actually, actually, I didn't notice this until my one of my colleagues tell me lah. Uh, I noticed actually a lot of you guys using, uh, lay term rather than a proper medical term. I'm not sure whether is this is is it because of your reference, uh, problem with your reference. Or uh, vocab ni problem I tak sure lah. Tapi bet, uh, next time kan try to use as much scientific term uh, as possible and move away from lay term lah. Lay term macam contoh, uh, yeah like you you've mentioned brain swelling, because these are actually description given to patient tau rather than to doctors. Faham tak? Try use term macam cerebral edema, uh, ataupun uh, tu lah, more specific term like that lah, rather than swelling of the brain, um, because uh, that will train you later when you present. Okay, okay, proceed with the next one. Hello, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can all of you hear me? Yes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So my name is Nur Izati Amira binti Maizani and I will present on the uh, pen hypopituitary. Uh, my metric number is 1814748. And this is the outline of the, my presentation. Okay, we will start with uh, anatomy and physiology of uh, pituitary gland. Actually, pituitary gland is referred as the uh, master of the endocrine gland. And uh, pituitary gland is a small pea-sized uh, gland that is um, about one centimeter in diameter and weigh uh, about 500 milligram. It's located uh, in the cellular of a spinal bone and uh, it consists of two parts which is uh, anterior lobe uh, adenohypophysis and also uh, posterior lobe which is uh, neurohypophysis. So uh, we will look at the adenohypophysis hormone. So the first uh, hormone is uh, growth hormone and this hormone will stimulate body growth uh, and it also stimulates the secretion of insulin like growth factor 1 and growth hormone also stimulate lipolysis, uh, inhibition of insulin and on carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. The second hormone is prolactin, uh, which uh, stimulates uh, the milk production. The third one is uh, SPH or adrenocorticotropic hormone that will uh, stimulate production of glucocorticoid and androgen uh, by the ad adrenal cortex. And this hormone also uh, maintains size of uh, zona fasciculata and zona reticularis of cortex. 
So the next hormone is a thyroid stimulating hormone uh, that will stimulate production of uh, thyroid hormone by thyroid follicular cells and maintain uh, the size of follicular cells. And the next uh, hormone is follicular stimulating hormone. Uh, that will uh, very full in uh, spermatogenesis in the testes. And hormone that cause uh, ovulation and formation of the corpus luteum in the ovary. And this hormone also stimulate production of estrogen and progesterone by ovary and stimulate testosterone by production by the testes. Okay, moving on to the posterior uh, posterior pituitary gland uh, or neurohypophysis. The hormone uh, that be produced by this uh, pituitary gland is the first one is oxytocin that uh, this oxytocin will simu stimulate uterine contraction and it will cause um, uh, and it will initiate labors and this also stimulates the smooth muscle of the breast to initiate uh, mid ejection and the next one is uh, ADH and generated hormone or vasopressin that will stimulate kidney tubules to tubule cell to reabsorb water uh, the important of we know all of this um, hormone is because uh, panhypopituitarism uh, is um, refers to involvement of all pituitary hormone. So we need to know the hormone to um, know about the clinical features based on the hormone involved. So basically, um, I put the definition of hypopituitarism and panhypopituitarism. Panhypopituitarism uh, is a clinical syndrome of a deficiency of one or more pituitary hormone production, while panhypopituitarism refers to involvement of all pituitary hormone. It's, uh, pan is um, is all, so it can lead adrenal cortical function. Okay, um, hypopituitarism is listed as the rare disorder by the National Institute of Health. And it less uh, it affecting less than two hundred thousand individuals in the United States. For Malaysia, I didn't find any data that specifically um, mentioned about hypopituitarism. Okay. So, what's the pathophysiology that can lead to the hypopituitarism? So, uh, when the pituitary hormone production is impaired. Uh, the target gland hormone production is reduced because of lack of tropic stimulus. So normally, uh, sub-physiologic target hormone levels uh, stimulate to increase tropic hormone production. So when there is hypopituitarism, uh, pituitary gland response is absent. Uh, so it can result to, uh, and the patient uh, will uh, present as uh, low target hormone levels accompanied by low or inappropriately normal level of the corresponding tropic hormone. So for the etiologies, uh, for etiology of uh, hypopituitarism in children, uh, we can uh, place we can remember or simplify by using the mnemonic crash. So this crash. And uh, C stands for uh, craniopharyngioma or any uh, intracranial tumor, uh, tumor, tumors, uh, charge syndrome, and also CPHD. R stands for radiotherapy, uh, cranial irradiation, uh, oncology treatment, and I will explain later about these more details. And A for acquired brain injury, S for septo optic dysplasia, and uh, H for holoprosencephaly. So for the first one is craniopharyngioma, the C. Uh, the craniopharyngioma is uh, a benign tumor that arises from usually in the supracellular area. And um, the characteristic of two C's and two S and two E's. For the C is calcified and cystic as a slow glowing and uh, Squamous epithelial, E for extra 
extra edge ya, mean outside of the brain. So the there can be one or two years onset uh, of the first symptom. There can be one or two years between onset of the first sy symptoms and um, usually the size of tumor is three centimeters before the patient can present with symptoms. And this tumor is uh, rarely diagnosed before two years old and it tends to present at five to 14 years old. So uh, this is the picture of the tumor that I googled for the internet. So um, the size of the tumor can uh, determine uh, the symptoms. If the uh, usually cranioma is uh, affecting the pituitary gland, so it can cause uh, endocrine system symptoms and also visual symptoms. So endocrine symptoms related to growth uh, failure thyroid hypofunction, adrenal hypofunction, and all other presenting symptoms that you can see in my slide. And for visual symptoms, it's due to the involvement to the uh, optic chiasm uh, that can uh, result in visual loss, visual field defect, and others. Okay, moving on to the C also is uh, chart syndrome. Chart syndrome Chart syndrome is uh, autosom autosomal dominant that compromise of C, which is colobomatous malformation of the eyes. So this is a congenital abnormality of the uh, product of development of membrane of the eye. So you can see in this picture. And H stands for heart anomaly. Uh, example of uh, heart anomaly is tetralogy of failure. failure. Uh, which is uh, overriding of aorta, pulm pulmonary stenosis, ventricular septal defect, and uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. And for R, it is a uh, retardation of both cognitive and somatic growth. And for G, is a uh, genital anomalies or hypoplasia in male. And the last one, E, stands for ear anomalies or deafness. So for the C also, is a combined pituitary hormone deficiency. Uh, it is a, uh, a condition a disease that can uh, do, that cause decrease pituitary, in pituitary hormone secretion. And the most common mutation uh, is the PROP1 gene or profit of PIT1 gene, which compromise of uh, 10, 12 to 55% of known case. And this gene uh, is involved in trans transcription process, uh, factors which act to control other genes and very essential for uh, of development and uh, cell type uh, radiotherapy. Uh, prophylactic or therapeutic radiation uh, frequently leads to abnormalities in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, usually, uh, this radiation does not affect the posterior pituitary, and usually it only affects the anterior pituitary. So uh, when there is um, defect in the anterior pituitary by the uh, radiation, it is uh, usually irreversible and progressive. The third one is uh, acquired brain injury. Acquired brain injury is a major cause of pituitary dysfunction. Uh, traumatic brain injury, um, it either can cause a direct pituitary gland or stock injury, or either ischemia or infarction to the pituitary gland, or even hypothalamus. So the first one is uh, septal optic dysplasia. Uh, it is um, disorder of uh, early brain develop development. That, uh, that uh, it is a heterogeneous disorder that clinically uh, it diagnosed with two or more classical triads, which is a hypoplasia of the optic nerve, hypoplasia of pituitary gland, or uh, midline brain anomalies, uh, which is absence of septum, septum pellucidum, a genesis of corpus callosum. And fresh, so H, the last one is. Holoprosencephaly or HPE. 
um, it is due to failure of proencephalon to divide adequately into two half during the uh, gestation. Uh, it is the most common uh, for causing malformation and so if environmental, it can from the maternal diabetes, drugs, alcohol or maternal treatment with uh, retinoid acid. And to easily remember the um, features of HPE is pneumonic HPE fuse, H for hypotonia, uh, hypotonic dysfunction, head size, hydrocephalus, P, pituitary deficiency, pneumonia, epilepsy, E for epilepsy, F for feeding difficulty, U for uncoordinated oral sensory function, S for spinal bifida, sorry for the typo, uh, uh, E for eating disorder or esophageal reflux, D for developmental delay. So this is uh, what I Google, uh, the HPE features such as hydrocephalus and so on. Okay, uh, next for the clinical features, uh, there's a long list uh, that uh, I got from the one of the books. And I think I will not uh, explain more on this. Uh, I think uh, you can um, read on my slide that I provided earlier in the group WhatsApp. So I will proceed. Okay. Last one is investigation. Uh, for uh, to assess the hypopituitarism, uh, we can use triple function test. Um, triple function test is used to assess hypopituitarism. And for uh, anterior pituitary, we can do stimulation test uh, when there is gross hormone hyposecretion, hypocorticalism, and also hypothyroidism. So this is the list of the um, tests that you can do, which is insulin test, adrenaline infusion test, and okay, this the list. And for the posterior pituitary, we can test for the uh, diabetes insipidus, which is the fluid deprivation test and also vasopressin test. So the patient with, uh, administered with insulin, this is to uh, test for the uh, test for the growth hormone and also ACTH. And uh, patient also administered with uh, TRH to stimulate uh, TSH and prolactin and also the NIH to stimulate LDH. So uh, uh, when, uh, after the patient is administered, administered with these three uh, hormones, so uh, patient blood will check for plasma, gross hormone and cortisol, plasma TSH and prolactin, and plasma LH and FSH. Uh, so when there is a pituitary hypofunction, all hormones level are low. So this is what I get from uh, Dr. Zamzila's lecture note for uh, last year. Uh, and I think for the details, you can uh, read in, in the Dr. Zamzila's lecture. Okay, next we can do a uh, imaging test, which is we can do brain MRI. Uh, we can check for any uh, intracranial pathologies uh, or any tumors or SOD, which is septic, uh, septo optic and HPE. And also we can do a hand and wrist radiography for bone age. Uh, this radiograph is to estimate the age of the patient and it can provide uh, clues or guidance to the regarding the patient's growth uh, potential and sex hormone exposure. Uh, and the bone age are frequently delayed in patients with hypopituitarism. Okay. So I think that's all from me. Um, any question? Uh, I have one question. Tak siapa yang tanya soalan tadi? Okay, I have a question. Uh, as I as I as I remember, uh, one of the complication of the, uh, you know the the apa the
Do what? Hello, you come? Apa soalan tadi? Soalan khusus asas habis. Okey, tak apa. So, ada any other questions? Okay, actually kan, uh, pen apa tu is is big lah, is involve almost all mm. all tumor kan? Ah, yeah. uh, tumor Hmm. Uh, actually the main thing is actually when we talk about pen hypopic kan. Uh, that's the main uh, main hormone involved. Okay. There definitely other hormone that will, will will involve. Tapi the three main uh, concerning pediatric is actually you punya ADH, you punya thyroid, uh, TSH and also you punya uh ACTH. These are the three main hormone yang concern pediatric lah. Let the only one special. Uh, huh? the three which what what hormone you see just now? Uh ACTH. ACTH, okay. Uh ADH. ADH. And TSH. Okay. Thank you Okay, so ADH usually patient with hypophit, pen hypophit. Kan kalau memang this is genetic pen hypophit atau uh, syndromic child. Uh they will initially the first session will be most of the time is prolonged jaundice. <coughs> okay, they can attend prolonged jaundice because of growth hormone deficiency. Because growth hormone is the most important, uh, especially during uh, early early childhood. Yeah? So growth hormone deficiency will manifest the earliest lah. Okay, and, and then secondly, they can have a problem with thyroid. Uh, eh, sorry, thyroid and also growth hormone both can cause uh, prolonged jaundice. And then uh, <coughs> later on, they can start develop the eye lah. This atom <coughs> ADH deficiency, so they can develop the eye. So the eye they usually presented as seizure because of hypernatremia lah. Hypernatremia dapat seizure ataupun uh, incident finding hypernatremia. Uh, and then later on, they datang shock. So lambat sikit, they akan datang shock. Because of lack of cortisol lah, ACTH punya deficiency. And these are the three hormones yang kena replace. So most of patient with pen hypopit, they akan ada replacement cortisol. And then dia ada dengan hydrocot. And then the um, replacement of uh, thyroid hormone with levothyroxine. And also replacement of uh, ADH with minilin ataupun ADH lah. Uh, minilin atau ADH. Okay, faham? And then specific young, the rest too not that important in the sense of once you need, once the child attain puberty, uh, then you need uh, to add effect, uh, the hormone lah, the estrogen pill lah, you bagi pill, the combined pill semua lah. Okay kan? Okay, okay ada soalan lain? Thank you, Dr. Okay, any more questions? Okay, kau tak ada next lah. Shmina, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Uh, so we start my presentation. Uh, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I am Aida Aguila. So I will continue with other endocrine disorder, uh, which are hypothyroidism and also hypothyroidism. Uh, next. Um, this is uh, this will be my presentation outline where I will start with uh, this, uh, uh, previous uh, where we start with the basic uh, medical sciences uh, knowledge briefly only, and then we go to the uh, hyper and hypothyroidism and I will end my presentation with investigation next. So first um, we will start with anatomy of thyroid gland. Uh, so the thyroid gland 
is the largest uh, endocrine organ in our body and it involved with production, storage and also release of thyroid hormones. So the location of the thyroid gland is at anterior of the neck and inferior to the larynx. Uh, the thyroid gland is butterfly uh, shape and consists of right and left uh, loops and it connected by a narrow thickness. So uh, thyroid gland uh, produce two types of, of hormone uh, which are thyroid hormones and also calcitonin. Next, uh, we move to the histology part. So thyroid gland compose more than 1 million follicles and thyroid follicles is the functional unit for the thyroid gland. So this follicle is spherical in shape and lined by a single layer of cuboidal epithelial cell, which is known as uh, follicular cells. So a uh, follicular cell will synthesize and secrete thyroglobulin into the lumen of the follicles, which contain colloid. Uh, and colloid will act as storage for the thyroglobulin. So follicular or C cell uh, will secrete uh, calcitonin that helps uh, lower the calcium level in our blood. And this cell can be found in the line of the follicle or as clump between the follicles. Next. We move to the development of thyroid gland. Uh, the thyroid function uh, develops in three stages. So at the end of the first trimester, uh, the gland descends from the floor of the primitive oral cavity to its definitive position in the anterior lower neck. Uh, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis become functional in the second trimester and peripheral metabolism of thyroid hormones matures in the third uh, trimester. Next. So, uh, we move to the uh, effect of thyroid hormone. Um, as we know that thyroid hormone uh, is very important as it plays a major role in our growth and development. So first, uh, it affects on our heart myocardium, where it will increase contractility of the heart, uh, thus uh, increase stroke volume and also cardiac output. It also uh, add on as a node, where it will increase membrane action potential, and then lead to the increase in heart rate and also blood pressure. Uh, for GIT, uh, it will stimulate secretion of GI hormones or enzyme, and also increase the mortality of the GI. So in the liver, uh, thyroid hormones will increase uh, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, and also increase the number of LDL receptor, which will help lower down the LDL level in our blood. It also affects the development of the brain by increasing uh, dendrite formation, myelination, and also synapse. Uh, for integumentary system, um, thyroid hormone will increase sympathetic activity, which increase in sweating and helps our body to cool down. And as for the bone, uh, thyroid hormones will balance osteoblast and osteoblast activity of the bone. And it also involves in the interstitial growth and also bone remodeling. I'm sorry if my connection is slow. Okay, next we move to the hypothyroidism, our concern for today. So hypothyroidism is a clinical syndrome resulting from the deficiency of the thyroid hormones, which in turn result in the general slowing down of metabolic process. So this may result from the disease of the thyroid gland, or it can be due to any abnormalities in the pituitary or hypothalamus. Hypothyroidism can be congenital or, or acquired and may or may not be associated with a goiter. Next. So, we we'll start with congenital uh, hypothyroidism first. So for congenital hypothyroidism is inadequate thyroid hormone production in newborn infants. So incident of congenital hypothyroidism worldwide is 1 to 2,500 to 4,000 live the birth. For in Malaysia, the incident is 1, 1 to 2,200 to 300 live birth. And this data, uh, uh, can we get from National Congenital Hepatitis Screening Program? So next, uh, the causes of congenital hepatitis can divide into four, which are maladaptation of the thyroid 
uh, and atherosis, this homogenesis, iodine deficiency, and also THS uh, deficiency. Uh, for maladaption of thyroid and atherosis, it is the commonest cause of sporadic congenital hepatitism. In this case, uh, the thyroid gland may fail to develop completely or partially. It also may due to the thyroid gland remain as a lingual mass or a unilobular small gland. Uh, for uh, this homogenesis, it is an inborn error of thyroid hormone synthesis, and it occurs about 5 to 10% of the cases. And it commonly occurs in some ethnic group with consanguineous marriage. For iodine deficiency, it also uh, the one of the commonest cause of hypothyroidism, but only at certain place, which is in developing country. And this can be prevented by iodination of salt in the in diet. Hypothyroidism also can occur due to the THS deficiency but it is a rare case and usually associated with thin hypopituitarism, as we learned before. So next, uh, we move to the clinical manifestation of congenital hypothyroidism. So most infants are asymptomatic at birth, but the sign and symptom become more prominent with age. So it is important to perform neonatal screening of thyroid function on all the newborn babies to prevent from getting uh, this kind of disorder. So the early signs and symptoms of congenital hypothyroidism are prolonged jaundice, failure to thrive, feeding problems, and constipation. And so uh, if the babies are left untreated, uh, they will develop other clinical signs and symptoms by three to six months of age, such as coarse faces, dry skin, macroglossia, hoarse cry, umbilical hernia, lethargic, uh, slow movement, uh, mental retardation and also problem with development milestone. So next, we move to the acquired hypothyroidism. So the most common cause for acquired hypothyroidism is Hashimoto thyroiditis, or also known as chronic autoimmune thyroiditis or chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Uh, it is characterized by destruction of the thyroid cell by various cell and antibody mediated immune process. So the common, uh, so this disease is common cause of hypothyroidism in all the child and adolescent and frequently occurs in the female rather than male. So there is several immunological mechanisms that may contribute to the death of the thyroid The first is reaction of CD4 plus T cell to the thyroid antigen and this cell will see produce cytokines, which is interferon gamma. And this will promote inflammation and activate macrophages as in a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. So in this case, the injury to the thyroid cell result from the toxic product of the inflammatory cell itself. Next is CD8, a plus cytotoxic T cell mediated cell death. So this CD8 plus T cell uh, may recognize antigen on the uh, thyroid cell and they may kill, and they kill this cell. And last but not least, the possible mechanism is binding of antithyroid antibodies, followed by antigen dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity mediated by the NK cells. So next, we move to the clinic, uh, clinical manifestation for acquired hepatorism. As you can see in the listed board, uh, listed in the board, just a short stator, Cold intolerance, dry skin, cold periphery, thin, dry hair, hair, puffy eye with loss of eyebrow, constipation, sleep upper, femoral uh, epiphysis, as in the picture above, uh, below, a uh, slow relaxing reflex, bradycardia, obesity, delay, puberty, learning difficulties, and also deterioration in schoolwork. So, next. So we move to the hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is a condition characterized by overproduction of thyroid hormone. So the most common cause of hypothyroidism in children is grief disease. Next. So grief, so grief disease is an autoimmune disorder resulting from thyrotropins, THS receptor stimulation by autoantibodies. And uh, this disease is rare actually, as it accounts only one to five percent of cases. But uh, and 
this disease or commonly occurs in female compared to male, and it peaks in adolescent. Uh, this disease is also associated with other autoimmune diseases and also present in children with familiar history of autoimmune thyroid disease. Next, we move to the pathogenesis of grief disease. So, uh, pathogenesis of grief disease are mainly consists of autoantibodies to the, the, to the TSH receptor. Including first is thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin TSI. So TSI is an IgG antibody that binds to the TSH receptor and mimic the action of state TSH. Then uh, it will result in increasing re releasing of thyroid hormone. Second is thyroid growth stimulating immunoglobulin TGI. Uh, this antibody also directed against the TSH receptor and has have been implicated in the proliferation of thyroid follicular epithelium. And last mechanism is TSH binding inhibitor immunoglobulin. So this anti-TSH receptor antibodies prevent TSH from binding normally to its receptor uh, on the thyroid epithelial cell. So in the cell, some of them will mimic the action of TSH and some will inhibit thyroid cell function. So next is the clinical manifestation of the hypothyroidism uh, in, the, in the children. So as you can see, uh, the children will manifest anxiety, restlessness, uh, sweating, diarrhea, uh, weight loss, even though there is an increase in appetite, uh, rapid growth in the height, advanced bone maturity, tremor, tachycardia, warm, uh, vasodilated peripheries, psychosis, behavioral problem, or learning difficulties. And they also can present with bilateral goiter and also uh, exothalmos, as you can see, the bulging eye uh, from the picture. So, next. Uh, next uh, this is, will be my last uh, topic for my presentation, which is investigation. So for the investigation, we can do thyroid function test, thyroid function test, which can which can be considered as the first test if you want to know uh, whether the patient is having thyroid problems or not. So uh, thyroid function test help clinician to diagnose thyroid disease such as hyper and hypothyroidism, red disease, Hashimoto thyroiditis, and other thyroid problems such as nodules or cancer. So first we. We can measure TSH, third generation TSH AC. Uh, they are able to measure low level of TSH down to 0 0.005, mainly international unit per liter. And this AC able to distinguish hyperthyroid patients with a, high, with a higher certainty. So next, we also can measure concentration of total T3 and T4. This measurement, uh, we measure the uh, both uh, bowel and free thyroid hormone in, uh, in our blood. And this measurement is affected by the level of binding protein. So in a condition where the serum uh, binding protein altered, uh, total thyroid hormones no longer uh, reflect free thyroid hormone concentration. Uh, we also can measure free T3 and free T4. And this measurement uh, is more physiologically relevant and more accurate to indicate a uh, thyroid function as the levels are not uh, affected uh, by, um, uh, by the protein. So free T4 is used to confirm diagnosis of hyper and hyperthyroidism, while free T3 is useful to diagnose T3 thyrotoxicosis. Okay, next. Uh, we, uh, another additional test that can be done is by measure uh, thyroid antibodies. So first, we measure thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin TSI. So TSI is a form of IgG that can bind to, to the thyrotropin receptor on the thyroid gland, and they mimic the action of TSH, causing excess secretion of the thyroid scene, uh, of the thyroid, uh, hormone. So high level of TSI in the blood can indicate the presence of uh, great disease. We also can uh, measure thyroglobulin antibody, TG. So 
this antibody is associated with autoimmune autoimmune thyroiditis, but not specific for Hashimoto thyroiditis. But most of the time, patients with Hashimoto thyroiditis have high level of Pg in their blood. It also can be positive in graffitis. And lastly, we, we measure thyroid microsomal peroxidase antibody, or we call it now as thyroid peroxidase or TPO. So this antibody uh, elevated in 95 to 99% of patients with Hashimoto thyroiditis. Uh, very high data of more than 1 to 5,000 in non-toxic water indicate Hashimoto thyroiditis. Uh, even though uh, there is some patient of uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis negative for this uh, antibody. And this antibody also positive in the grave disease. So I think that's all for me. Thank you. So, is there any question? Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, yes. Uh, based on the investigation of the antibodies that you showed before. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that there is no specific uh, antibodies that can show to us whether it is uh, Hashimoto or not Hashimoto's. Uh, from what I read, um... Uh, from what I read, uh, uh, Hashimoto, uh, most of the patients with Hashimoto, uh, Hashimoto disease uh, will have TG and uh, TPO antibodies in their blood most of the time. And for the Graves disease, uh, the presence of TSI, uh, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. That's. Am I answering your question? Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh... Okay, basically the Hashimoto and Griffs are autoimmune in nature. Lah. So, however, this uh, autoantibody is, is non-specific. Eh? They're non-specific. So, it doesn't mean that patient ada this antibody means that they're Hashimoto. Okay, but it does shows that once patient ada any of these antibodies means patient memang ada uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. We call it autoimmune thyroiditis. Huh? Usually, we, we don't nowadays we move away from giving names, lah. Okay, except for grief, memang kita guna Hashimoto. Biasanya we just say thyroiditis macam tu. Uh, because you have to understand historically, and most of this condition, kan, yang ada nama ni, kan, contoh macam Guillain Barre, uh, Wilson disease. You know this um, because uh, most of these names come about during the World War One, tau. World War One, because what happened is, uh, these researchers, researchers um, from Germany, Spain, the Russian researchers, they did research on uh, prisoners. So they did research of prisoners of war. Now this is most of these research are very unethical research. Macam kalau you tengok cerita, betul macam cerita Captain America tu kan, Winter Soldier tu kan, and they did this kind of research are done. This is a true though. This is not something that man made lah. This is um true in history. So they did this unethical research, which definitely cannot be done nowadays uh, due to ethical issues. So they, they did all this kind of research and they name, they put their name into the disease, to the disease. Huh? Uh, so what happened, we call the disease by their names. But in fact, these are actually from non-ethical research. So nowadays we are moving away from giving names, using names, uh, the previous names uh, to disease, rather than we use description. For example, like you know, Chakot meritus. We no longer call it chakot meritus. We call it chronic inflammatory demyelinating uh, neuropathy, uh, things like that. So rather than we use name, we use description, which is more minable. Uh, and there's more mean on, in it. Okay, Fawen. Right? So, so, you... so, huh? so when we make diagnosis, we do, we say autoimmune thyroiditis. Yes. Yes, that, that's sufficient. You don't have to say this grave governor. Some old school, and some old uh, doctors, memang they love to use all these names. In fact, all the findings, you don't have to use names. Yeah, findings, clinical findings, you names. But the disease, you don't have to use names, just description. Uh, there are the specific names for them, but you don't have to use the uh, specific name of a person. 
Bila kau baca ICD-10 ke uh, DSM-5 uh, ke Most diagnosis nowadays uh, use this uh, descriptive rather than uh, like uh, nominal lah ataupun uh, nama Okay ada anything else? This same goes with DM eh, DM type 1, type 2 just now kan uh, The presence of immunoglobulin Okay, uh, and, and auto antibody is uh, will helps in diagnosis, but it's not compulsory because type one DM is diagnosis. Uh, it can be diagnosed but just by clinical. For example, if you got a child more than six month old, uh, presented with DKA as main presentation, uh, presented with ketosis kan, uh, as main presentation might not be DKA, tapi ketosis lah. Presence of ketone more than six month old, thin build. Uh, no acanthosis nigricans, you can actually conf confidently diagnose this is type 1 DM. You don't have to take all the autoimmune auto -immune screening. No, you don't have all the islet cell antibody, the insulin antibody. Uh, these are not required to make diagnosis of type 1 DM. Uh, it's based on clinical. The only difficult difficulty is, for example, like type 2 DM. Because type 2 DM is a polygenic diabetes. So there's a lot of factor. They are involved environmental and also genetic factors. Uh, so macam type 2 DM, you might you may have some difficulties, especially bila patient datang uh, young onset. Because there's a lot of other di diabetes ni ada banyak tau. You ada Modi, uh, you ada familial DM. Even the familial DM, you ada yang few, there's few monogenic DM, diabetic, uh, polygenic, you ada Dan syndrome. Uh, banyak lah. So usually all this investigation will help but it's not included in the diagnostic criteria. Okay. Uh, untuk management, we're not going to touch on the management. But it's good to read a lot, read about uh, screening lah, screening for congenital hypothyroidism. In fact, the most important is congenital hypothyroidism lah, because this is preventable disease, uh, and it's very common. I think the the incident is about one in three thousand or one in one thousand. You know, it's very common. Eh? Okay, this one. Okay, kalau tadi kita proceed dengan last one kan? Oh, yes. Okay, good. So, I do class A1. Okay, okay. Um, let me share my screen first. So... Okay. Um, okay, my name is Kila Binti Ismail. Um, now I'm going to continue with my presentation on RECATS. So this is my presentation outline. Okay, um, we're going to start with definition and end with investigations. So first of all, we have to know what is RECATS. So RECATS is defined as decrease or defective bone mineral growing children is when the epiphyseal plate is still closed. And by 20th century, uh, RICATS has become endemic, particularly in industrialities of Northern Europe. This situation can actually be explained um, when inadequate sun exposure um, was considered as one of the main causes of RICATS um, nowadays. But you, you, you will understand more uh, on this um, throughout this presentation. And it's important for us to note that the term um, osteomalacia is used to describe the exact same condition, but I mean, occurring in adults, okay? when the epiphyseal plate is still um, is, is, is already closed. So now the epidemiology of rickets. In the US and Europe, rickets occurs mostly in breastfed uh, infants who have dark skin and receive no vitamin D supplementation. Uh, in Africa, uh, rickets occurs mainly of nutritional deficiency causes, particularly calcium and phosphorus deficiency. Uh, and on the other hand, in the Middle East, uh, rickets occur in infants bundled in clothing and are not exposed to sunlight. Um, in Malaysia, in Malaysia, uh, a study conducted uh, on 2010 to 2011, uh, it is reported that the cases of rickets is higher in Malay and Indian, and 78 Point eight percent the cases are of children uh, of the age of thirteen years old, and it uh, and most of the cases are also from among among the 
people from among the children from the urban area as compared to rural areas. And in another study, um, it is reported that there is an increase in the incidence of nutritional deficiency rickets uh, among the children of 7 to, 20, uh, 7 to 12 years old, which is 35.5% in 2008, increased to 47.5% in 2009. So actually, previously, the um, nutritional rickets um, has, been, has been reported to, to dissipate. Um, particularly in industrialized um, countries because of the um, vitamin D fortification food program um, has started. But um, in the past 10 to 20 years, it has been reported that there are re-emergence of nutritional rickets uh, and it may be due to probably, um, you know, some other combination of um, other contributing factors. And now these are the risk factors um, of rickets. Dark skin, um, dark skin because dark skin people um, actually has more of the um, melanin pigment, which um, which uh, reduces which um, reduces the ability of the skin to to produce vitamin D in the sunlight, and then the mother and the mother's vitamin D during pregnancy. Of course, the the child um, would be at risk of vitamin D deficiency too. And inadequate sun exposure, particularly um, for those who are living in northern latitudes. Um, but I think nowadays it doesn't really matter wherever you live because, um, for example, if you live even in a hot country like Malaysia, but um, you are leading, I would say, a, a, a very sedentary lifestyle, you know, playing video games at home and plus uh, PKPB some more. So um, the child um, is still at risk to have as well uh, and premature birth because the babies had uh, less um, time to receive vitamin D from the mother in the womb and then a uh, child with uh, exclusive breastfed uh, um, because the actually the breast milk doesn't contain enough um, vitamin D to, to prevent rickets and of course children with poor nutrition um, for example like those who are vegan definitely deficient many of uh, important nutrients that include, of course, uh, vitamin D, calcium, and phosphorus as well. Okay, now um, when we're talking about rickets, um, the most important concept in physiology uh, would be vitamin D metabolism. So the process starts with the pro-vitamin D, pro-vitamin D3 converted into pre-vitamin D3 with the presence of UV light from the sun. And the pre-vitamin D3 is converted into vitamin D3 or also known as uh, cholecalciferol via the process of isomerization. So this cholecalciferol is produced, is formed in the skin and it will be transported into the liver to undergo the first hydroxylation process by the enzyme 25 hydroxylase to produce calcidiol or 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol And it's important to uh, this calcidiol, the 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol um, is a widely used biomarkers to check for the level of vitamin D of the cutaneous synthesis as well as from the dietary intake. Okay? And then this calcidiol will undergo the second hydroxylation process in the kidney uh, um, by the enzyme 1 alpha hydroxylase and mediated by parathyroid hormone to produce calcitriol, uh, also known as 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol. And this calcitriol is the active form of vitamin D and it's a hormone that affects uh, on many organs, including intestines, uh, it increased calcium and phosphorus absorption. In bone, it increased calcium absorption and mineralization. In kidney, it increased renal tubular absorption of calcium. And in parathyroid uh, gland, it decreased PTH synthesis and secretion, uh, which is um, sort of a, a negative feedback. Um, and it's important for you to note that um, if there is any abnormality in any of the steps in vitamin D metabolism, then you can expect that the effects of calcitriol cannot be achieved, uh, in which it may lead to um, failure to, 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 to maintain the balance of uh, calcium and phosphorus. Now that we already understand the physiology, can, um, 
we, we, we can understand the etiology and classification of rickets. So basically, rickets can be divided into two main categories, which are calcipanic rickets and phosphoponic rickets. For calcipanic rickets, it is um, related with the vitamin D and calcium deficiency, uh, in which these can be further divided um, into according to the associated disorders, depending on, on which side of the vitamin D metabolism is affected. So you see, vitamin D deficient rickets can be caused by nutritional uh, deficiency and inadequate exposure to sunlight. Vitamin D malabsorption can be caused by celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, uh, and biliary, biliary atresia, which is uh, related with fat malabsorption. And we know that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. 25 hydroxylase deficient is supposedly to be produced by the liver for the first hydroxylation process, but can be deficient in liver disease. An increase in vitamin D metabolism uh, can be caused by anticonvulsant drugs like phenytoin, and 1 alpha hydroxylase deficiency can be caused by renal failure of vitamin D dependent rickets type 1 or VDDR type 1, which is a hereditary disorder, um, hereditary disorder related with the vitamin D metabolism. And the other one, we have N organ resistance to vitamin D, uh, which can have vitamin D dependent rickets type 2, VDDR type 2. Uh, also, a hereditary disorder, but um, it is off related with the um, vitamin D action. And the other type of rickets is phosphoponic rickets. And rickets associated with phospho uh, hypophosphatemia is usually of genetic. Um, causes. So genetic mutation um, can be can happen in X-linked hypophosphatemia and HHRH, renal tubular disorders in Fenkini syndrome, nutritional phosphate deficiency can be caused by prematurity and diet, and tumors um, in tumor-induced osteomalacia. Okay, now um, I think based on the previous slide, you can already understand the pathophysiology can be different depending on the causes, right? But um, I want to elaborate more on the pathophysiology of vitamin D deficiency because this is the most important and the most common one. So vitamin D deficiency um, will cause a reduced calcium and phosphorus absorption from the intestine, which will uh, also reduce the level of serum calcium um, as well, and this will the 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 state of hypocalcemia will uh, stimulate the parathyroid gland to secrete parathyroid hormone. Okay, uh, so what are the effects of parathyroid hormone? It will decrease the phosphorus reabsorption in the kidney and increase mobilization of calcium and phosphorus from the bone. Um, that's why you can see here that serum calcium can be normal or low depending on the uh, compensatory mechanism by um, PTH. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, the, the balance between calcium and phosphorus is still negative because there is loss of um, phosphorus from the kidney. So this imbalance, this negative calcium and phosphorus balance uh, can disturb the bone metabolism and mineralization in which this process actually require both um, uh, the adequate amount of both calcium and phosphorus. So patient can present with and bones, which is consistent with rickets. Okay. And um, it's important for you to note that if the PTH is severely elevated, then uh, the patient can also present with tenny and seizure as a complication of um, severely low level of uh, serum calcium. So uh, patients with rickets can present with these clinical features and most of these clinical features are contributed by the abnormality of the, um, of the bone mineralization as well as the bone remodeling. So patients can present with delayed closure for fontanelle, rachitic rosary, um, which is the enlargement of the costal chondral junction, and you can see a visible beading um, at the anterolateral aspect of the chest and pectus carinatum or pigeon chest, frontal bossing, cranial tabis. Uh, cranial tabis is a soft skull bone, and Harrison sulcus. Harrison sulcus is due to, um, because of the, you know, um, the uh, soften of the uh, lower ribs, of the bone of the lower ribs, then the, there will be an inward pull by the diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic uh, attachment. 
some other clinical features like uh, widening of the wrist and widening of ankle and bowing. And uh, this one, it's uh, the bowing of the legs depends age of the patient as well as the the uh, weight bearing patterns uh, in the limbs. For example, if uh, if infants, the bowing of the the bowing of the the bowing is more common in the forearm, or the upper limb. Okay, as compared to a toddler who who has started to walk, the bowing would be more of the of the legs, um, just like in this picture. Okay, and other features can include hypotonia, muscular weakness, wheezing, bone pain, and, and enamel hypoplasia. So um, actually, the clinical features are not very specific and it's not safe because you cannot uh, distinguish, you cannot differentiate uh, whether the patient is having rickets or uh, whether the patient is having some other conditions, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with the similar signs. So in order to make a diagnosis, you are recommended to proceed with the lab investigation for biochemical testing as well as radiography to look for uh, any skeletal abnormalities. The lab findings can be different uh, depending on the causes, but um, because general rickets is very common, so we will look into the diagnostic diagnostic tools of nutritional rickets specifically. So these are the important biomarkers in nutritional rickets: serum twenty five hydroxy D uh, cholecalciferol. If you can, if if you still remember the calcidiol, is expected to be low, and it may be present months before the clinical signs of rickets develop. Uh, in which it is also useful in in case you want to use it as a screening tool. And then uh, serum calcium is suspected to be low or normal, uh, in which the reason I have explained before. And it may, um, in a long in a long run, the hypocalcemia can actually lead to larvae, seizure, tetanic spasm, cardiomyopathy, and heart failure. Serum parathyroid hormone is suspected to be elevated. And um, there is also report that it is more severe in vitamin D deficiency cat. Uh, serum phosphate is suspected to be low and it's said to be the, the one that is responsible for the defects in growth plate. Uh, serum alkaline phosphatase is expected to be elevated. Um, actually, uh, alkaline phosphatase, we know that alkaline phosphatase is not specific to bone because other tissues can also uh, produce alkaline phosphatase. But you have to know that in children, um, most of the alkaline phosphatase actually uh, comes from the bone. So um, alkaline phosphatase, can give a significance with the severity of the condition. So these are the table that, um, okay, this actually shows the different um, biochemical finding in rickets. So it depends on the types and the causes of the, of the rickets. Uh, you can look into this later. The radiographic findings, um, okay, the radiograph will show widening of the growth plate and you can describe the irregular, the irregular end of the bone um, with cupping, fraying and splaying of the metaphysis and thin bony spur extending from the metaphysis to surround the uncalcified uh, growth plate and you can also see a poorly ossified epiphysis uh, characterized by a faint uh, in this thin border. Uh, some other radiographic findings, you can see, of course, for TPO as well as uh, bow weights. Okay. I think that's the end of my, yeah, that's the end of my presentation, some of my references. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Okay, so go ahead and do this, all right? Okay, this is very important and vitamin D is very important. In fact, it's the most, one of the most important vitamin in your body, okay? There's a lot of study done in vitamin D. Lah. In general, you know that uh, there's one uh, one center under the under UNICEF and WHO. WHO, uh, they have one, they, they started a research about, I think about five, six years ago. Uh, collaborative research on we call it bond b o n d bio for neuro for neuro development or something like that lah. so so far the, under the bond there's only five there are five uh, elements has, has been investigated so to most vitamin d lah, these are the five most important nutrients untuk development and also untuk development lah, in gen, uh, focusing on child children development so vitamin D is one of that, uh, one of the five. 
So included in the five is iron, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin A, and also something I can't remember. So anyway, so vitamin D is very important. Uh, in fact, it was found that uh, the metabol vitamin D is required for your maintenance of your sugar, hemostasis, your blood pressure, your cholesterol. So because a lot of study done when they search, when they look at the, when they compare the vitamin D level between uh, people with uh, uncontrolled diabetes uh, and also those with uh, refractory hypertension, most of them has vitamin D deficient that uh, partially corrected with vitamin D. So, and uh, you mentioned correctly, you kata tadi macam it's very common, especially in Northern Pole kan, North Pole. And South Pole is not that much. I say North Pole because South Pole, I don't do the own. Uh, North Pole uh, is very common, but apparently uh, we in the equator has been very, what you call it, uh, because, because we've got a lot of vitamin D. Uh, in our, in the survey, <coughs> in a screening done, uh, I think in 2000, 2010, I think we did uh, a mass screening, population screening for vitamin D deficiency. Uh, it turns out uh, our population, about 50% have vitamin D insufficient. And then about 10% have vitamin D deficient. So you have to understand vitamin D, they are insufficient and deficient. Uh, you have to differentiate between the both. Okay, uh, because uh, the management will be different. Okay, vitamin D deficient and vitamin D insufficient is different. Okay, uh, ni ha, ni bagus. Uh, cuma, uh, definitely those with uh, darker skin, more pigmented skin, uh, higher risk of uh, getting vitamin D deficiency lah. Uh, and rickets is not that uncommon. You'll see rickets uh, definitely in your life. Okay, I've seen a lot of rickets. Uh, lagi satu kan, uh, there's a lot of type of rickets. Uh, you've got, in general, we, we divide rickets into hypocalcemic rickets or hypophosphatomic rickets. That's the main uh, differential. And most hypophosphatomic rickets is actually genetic punya condition lah. Uh, most of them is actually X-Link. You've got X-Link, uh, hypophosphatomic rickets kan? Okay, X-Link hypophosphatomic rickets is is the most uh, hypophosphatomic rickets yang paling important is actually x -Link. And you got hype, you got rickets yang uh, resistant to vitamin D, rickets yang uh, vitamin D, vitamin D dependent, vitamin D independent. Macam tu there's a lot of uh, category lah, how you differentiate, how, how you classify uh, vitamin D deficiency. Uh, so in general, the requirement uh, for vitamin D is about 1,000 international unit per day. Okay, that's the requirement in general for uh, adult and older children. For younger children, it's about 500 uh, IU per day. Uh, and you have to understand the uh, metabolism of vitamin D, especially the D1, D2, D3, ergocalciferol, cholecalciferol, and you need to know which to supply to which patient. Okay, because vitamin D, there's, there's a lot of vitamin D. Okay, for those with normal kidney, because you have to understand eh, the end organ for metabolism is actually the kidney. Kan, you nampak kan? They start dekat skin, go to liver and finally to the kidney kan? So kidney is the end organ uh, before vitamin D activated. So for those with, vit with kidney problem, okay, they won't be able to activate the vitamin D even though vitamin D tu banyak. So those with vitamin D, uh, those with kidney rickets secondary to kidney. In the past, we call it rickets secondary to kidney lah, uh, rickets uh, kidney disease. But now we call it, uh, uh, what we call it? We call it uh, uh, bone. What is the name? I can't remember lah. Kidney bone disease or renal bone disease. I I think macam tu lah. Bukan renal bone disease means bone disease or rickets that caused by kidney problem. So this kind of people, this kind of patient, yang the, yang the rickets is actually because of the kidney problem, with those with CKD, ASRF, right? you tak boleh bagi the algo calciferol D2, D3. It won't work. Okay, it won't work. You need to give them the alpha calcidol ataupun uh, calcitriol, the activated vitamin D. 
And the problem with activated vitamin D is, ah, uh, bawah ni, yes. Problem with activated vitamin D is, uh, it is it has short half life, and you cannot keep it. You cannot store it. Can you tell vitamin A, D, E, K? Ni, kenapa dia so special? Because dia fat soluble, so you can keep it. Vitamin A, D, E, K. Ni, once you makan, dia akan store dekat you punya fat. Kalau vitamin B, C. Ni, you makan dia akan keluar ikut kencing. You cannot keep it. You cannot store it. Okay, tapi vitamin D, you can keep it in your fat. Tapi without with, uh, once you want to use it, the kidney will activate the vitamin D and you will use it. Okay, so without kidney, you tak boleh activate. So you need to give active vitamin D. And uh, infrequent lah, biasa dosing dia is TDS ataupun uh, TDS lah biasanya. TDS ataupun OD. But uh, kalau dia on dialysis, then you need to give like Uh, every other dialysis session, post dialysis, dia bagi you common tau kan? Oh, you dah buat, you dah buat IM kan? You tengok medicine? Kan? Ya, yeah, dah betul, doktor. Ah, so, kita bagi vitamin D kan dekat patient yang ESRF. Okay, patient yang ESRF, you need to give vitamin D. Tapi, kita bagi after dialysis. Sebab, kita bagi activated vitamin D, which can will be excreted through the urine. So, kalau you bagi before dialysis, then they gone lah. Dia akan keluar dengan dialysis lah. So you bagi after dialysis, you bagi you common lah. Bukan you common, apa nama dia? Yang pun tengok rasa you common. Bukan you common is hematopoiesis. Eh, tengok lah. Anyway, so uh, yang tu hematopoietin. Uh, okay, tapi kalau for supplement, for example, children with vitamin D deficient, kan? Ataupun you guys yang yang sedentary lifestyle macam I, yang memang tak kena matahari and tak boleh exercise. Uh, so, we give supplement vitamin D to OD3. Egocasiferol or colicasiferol. Because this vitamin are long, have long half-life uh, but need to be activated by the kidney. Okay, faham eh? So, kalau contoh you ada come across soalan, contoh I tanya you. Okay, uh, I've got a child with with uh, hypocasmic recats. Okay, nutritional recats. I tell nutritional recats because of vitamin D deficient. So, uh, how do you treat? Okay, first definitely kita kena kata increase intake kan, dietary intake. Lepas tu, increase sun exposure. Okay, lepas tu apa lagi? So, you boleh bagi supplement with vitamin D2 or D3. Egocasiferol or colicasiferol. Okay, kalau you kata bagi alpha alfacasidro, then that's wrong lah. Atau mucasitriol, that's wrong. Okay, faham eh? Okay, what else? Uh, tu kot. Tapi remember, kalau you understand the vitamin D punya metabolism kan, insyaAllah you can understand the most of the hormone punya punya metabolism. Because most hormone are similar lah. Especially macam insulin. For example, insulin just now kan. We produce pro-insulin. Okay, we use pro, you, we produce pro-insulin. And then it, it will cleavage by your Golgi apparatus. So it will release the C-protein, C-peptide. And also the uh, the active insulin lah. So active insulin yang akan guna. So usually we akan synthesize the body, the tissue will synthesize in active uh, inactive form of the hormone or enzyme and which will later be activated by your target cell, target tissue, target organ. Okay, faham? Okay, ada soalan? Sorry, I'm quite obsessed with vitamin D lah because I'm, I like vitamin D. Okay, in fact, I, I do take vitamin D supplement lah, tapi sekarang dah tak ada duit sebab tak boleh. Okay, ada soalan? Actually, this, uh, I don't know, but I really like endocrine lah. Endocrine is one of my, one of my favorite. Um, I think for third years, kan, I would advise you guys to read a lot of physiology in your book. Okay, if you got, if you got strong physiology in your knowledge, kan, you'll be very good doctors. Believe me. Um, I mean, if you're thinking to, I mean, if you got spare time, kan, spend time read physiology. And then, kalau you nak jadi Okay, kalau you nak jadi a good doctor, okay, a minimum requirement is good in physiology. That's that's a good doctor lah. To me, it's a good doctor. If you want to be an outstanding doctor, you need to read biochemistry. And also my biochemistry and uh, biochemistry lah. If you're good in these two, you become outstanding doctors. You can explain everything in medicine. In fact, medicine is 90% idiopathic, which is kita tak tahu apa. Only 10% can be explained. But most people cannot explain even 1% of the 10%. Most people. Because they don't understand the physiology and the biochemistry. Okay. Ada soalan last? Before we go. Before we end. 
anyway very good presentation all uh maka alamak uh, i rasa nanti you guys akan chase me for for your mark uh nantilah nantilah i i tak sempatlah nak <laughs> nak mark siapa so, nanti I, i look through your presentation because i already listen to your present all your presentation kan later i look i look through your slides again and cakap dengan you punya colleague semua uh i'll get back to you guys your marks hopefully soon by end of this week okay okay doctor okay stop chasing me now okay 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 thank you doctor okay, okay thank you okay this uh i'm going to okay so come to law thank you doctor thank you doctor